you guys ever think about dying? Hey friends, Alicia Wagner here, host of the Mama Trauma Barbie podcast. We're landing the mothership in the real world by talking topics and tangents that deserve their own movement and momentum. Stick around. Together, we're redefining, reimagining, and rebuilding what motherhood means to you. And from there, we'll get the memo back to them. Before we move on, I'd like to thank the incredible sponsors who saw an opportunity to support women in their day-to-day journeys by joining together to make this podcast a reality. Thank you, Precision Chiropractic, Jennifer Panzition with Edward Jones, Dutch Maids, the Avalon Foundation, and Chica Creative for believing in better care, better support, and better outcomes for mamas and their families in the real world. Hey friends, welcome to episode number one with my friend Beth Lambert from Epidemic Answers. Before we get started though, you know, let's just set the tone. This might be one of those podcasts that maybe you're going to listen to and we might not agree on everything. And you know what? That's okay. I know before I ended up having a child with chronic illness that I had some beliefs myself. And so it took me going through this journey to really understand how I felt about certain things. And so we're going to safely get some topics out of the box today. We're going to safely lay them out on the table, and we're going to take some time to look at them together as a community. And we may agree to disagree on some topics, but in my opinion, that's how we're going to move forward to be able to not only help ourselves, but help our children and our communities heal, have better health, and have better outcomes. And so if everyone can just settle into their seat, take one big deep breath, and know that we're going to get through this together. So without further ado, I would like to take the opportunity to introduce the ridiculously amazing Beth Lambert. She's the executive director of Documenting Hope. She's an author, an educator, and former healthcare consultant who has monitored and documented the escalating rates of childhood chronic conditions for over a decade. Her first book, A Compromised Generation, provides a thorough analysis of the origins of this modern health crisis and documents how modifications to environmental and lifestyle factors can profoundly influence health outcomes, including full disease reversal. Beth is also the co-author of Brain Under Attack, a resource for parents and caregivers of children with PANS, PANDAS, and autoimmune encephalitis. Beth is the founder and executive director of Epidemic Answers, a 501c3 nonprofit organization dedicated to reestablishing vibrant health in our children. She is also the creator and executive producer of the Documenting Hope Project, a multi-year prospective research study and media project that examines the cumulative impact of environmental stressors on health and their mitigation through personalized and systems-based treatment approaches. Without further ado, welcome my friend, Beth Lambert. Thank you. I'm so happy to be here with you. You too. It was so great to spend last week with you in Orlando at the Documenting Hope Conference. And I got to be honest with you, you're you're literally one of these people for years that I've been stalking and and you don't know it, um, (laughs) but you have. And I'm just so grateful for your organization. I'm so excited to share you with more of the world who might not know about you. And you you must know, sis, and I don't think you do yet, that this podcast honestly would not be happening if it weren't for you. Like, had you not agreed to do this podcast and to be my first guest, I'm I'm not sure that we would be here because I think it's that important. And so it was a beautiful conference. I was blown away and it just it brought so much healing and perspective to my journey and I hope to many of the parents that we're going to be talking to today. Yeah, I'm glad you enjoyed the conference. It it was our first conference, but it was high time that we got our community of people together, the doctors, the practitioners, the parents, and, you know, felt like a community because there's so many people that are affected with all kinds of chronic conditions. And, you know, to have the opportunity to get together in person, give hugs, high fives, like it's really an important part of the healing journey. So I'm glad that you got to be there and witness the the first one. We'll have more. We'll do it next year. Yeah. I feel like they need to be every month. <laughs> <laughs> for, those of us, for those of us out here in this game, right? Like it feels like it needs to be every month, but we're going to share more about your nonprofit and what you're doing, which 
does give families an outlet. And so I want to start out with, for our listeners, look, before kids, which my oldest is 10, I was one of these people who thought that gluten sensitivities, right? They were a fad. Like this was just people who were making this up. I was an individual that um, the moms that maybe were getting a little bit elevated around their kids' behavior and calling it ADHD, that, you know what, maybe it was just an excuse that parents were grabbing onto to dismiss bad behavior in kids. I was the person before kids that when I heard moms talking about medicine sticks, which is what we're going to call those things that you get when your children are born, uh, so they don't get viruses, we're going to call them medicine sticks uh, mm-hmm. on this podcast so we don't get banned uh, from platforms. So that's our keyword. And then, you know, it was really, it was God saying, hold my beer when I had kids. Mm-hmm. And I, I was humbled. I, I was humbled by my daughter's out of the gate that I know now was chronic illness with her colic, uh, with her cradle cap eczema. Uh, with her medicine stick injury that she got at one. I was humbled later when her immune response completely crashed when she was four and got PANS, Pediatric Acute Onset Neuropsychiatric Syndrome. And so the reason I've been stalking you, Beth, is because you're literally for five years when I was out here searching for answers. And I love what your organization is called, Epidemic Answers. You were one of the places that I could land when it felt like nobody else out here knew what was going on, and it was absolutely one of the best resources. And so I bring all of this up because what I'm noticing, and I know what you're noticing, and what we all learned last week at the conference is it's not going so well out here for children and parents. And so it's my belief that chronic illness and toxic load is at the core of mama trauma and our current workplace dysfunction, the mental health crisis, the educational breakdown, the healthcare crossroad that we're at, that with 50% of families with chronic illness, they're all out here hanging on by a thread. Mm -hmm. And it's ripping marriages apart, families and their financial situation. It's ripping families apart and knowledge is power. And so that's really the the path that I want to go down today is knowledge is power. I was one of these people who had a belief before children. Now that I've gone through it, mind blown emoji, right? Mm -hmm. And so that's what I want to give parents today or grandparents or caregivers or mamas or individuals out here who might even be thinking about kids. What's going on? Why is this so important to talk about? And what can we do about it? So there's two main problems that I see. One is we have an epidemic of chronic health conditions, as you mentioned, that's unprecedented. We've never seen anything like this. It's unique to modern times. And this is the epidemics of autism, ADHD, asthma, allergies, obesity, autoimmune diseases, learning disabilities, like the list goes on and on and on. And what the the thing is, is that most people think these are like individual epidemics, like uh, autism is its own epidemic, obesity is its own epidemic, and they're not related. Fact of the matter is, they're all very much the same epidemic, and they're all caused by the same set of root, they all have the same root causes. Um, It's just how the symptoms are expressed depends on a child's unique medical history and their exposures, what, why, when, how. Um, But the other part problem is, is not just that we have this chronic health problem, is that we also have the uh, a, a medical system that is set up to suppress symptoms and manage these conditions with with um, pharmaceuticals or with therapies that are minimally helpful. Some are some are you know can help you manage and get through the day and you know but there there really are no institutions or medical schools um, in in conventional Western medicine that focus on the root causes. So that's the other part of the problem. Not only do we have an unprecedented number of six families and all the implications you talked about, marriages falling apart and, you know, uh, the cost burden, what what it's doing to our special education um, programs and schools, but we don't have a solution that actually unwinds these conditions for people. We just Mm -hmm. tell them, we're going to manage you with pharmaceuticals for the rest of your life. It's really a cradle to grave um, situation for pharmaceutical companies because they, they, that's all we got. But that the truth is, that's not all we got. We have solutions to these conditions, but it takes 
changing the way that we live, changing our diet, changing our habits, changing the way we think about health, changing our mindset, all of that has to happen in order to address the root causes that precipitated this problem in the first place. So it's really a twofold problem, too many sick kids and not enough answers that are doing the right thing for our kids. Yeah. You know, a lot of times these conversations become controversial, which is why I set up the beginning of the call that we did. And so what I would throw out to listeners is, look, this isn't an Alicia Wagner thing, or this isn't a Beth Lambert thing anymore. I mean, if you could go over some of the statistics and your presentation that you did on Sunday before we left Mm -hmm. the conference, like these statistics, we can, you can't ignore them anymore. They're, they're not us. They are fact as to what's going on out here. And these are the contributing factors. So would you be able to just get our listeners up to speed on what is the landscape out here? Yeah, so the statistics are changing because honestly, I don't think there are a lot of epidemiologists that are well trained in looking at the epidemic of chronic conditions um, in our kids because it's so new. We actually have our scientific director is an epidemiologist and we've tasked him with helping us present a better picture of what's actually happening to the kids. But we have, you know, one like the 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 last broad study that was done said that 54% of American children have at least one chronic health condition, sometimes two, three, four. So that was done in 2011. So we're at 2023. So that's that's over 10 years old. So no one's done that kind of comprehensive review of children's health and and chronic conditions. But we know it's worse. It's not getting better. Um, We have, you know, one in 31 kids with an autism spectrum disorder. The CDC says it's one in 36, but we've done some analysis on that. And the CDC is always off by, by a mark every time they come up with their updated numbers because the, the, the research catches up. We have one in three kids in America are either o- obese or overweight, or overweight. And we have at least one in two college-aged young adults who meet the criteria for some kind of psychiatric diagnosis. So think about that for a second. Half of the young adults who are our leaders in the future have some kind of problem with their mental health such that they might be diagnosed with a psychiatric condition. Um, most teens, like we're getting to the point where almost half of teens, you know, older teens are overweight or obese. So like the older they get, the the more the obesity creeps up. Um, and then there are some statistics I'd love to share from a 2022 assessment of the health of college kids. And that assessment that, again, this is more recent, this is last year, found that 77% were experience experiencing severe to moderate psychological distress. That's the vast majority of college kids are experiencing on a daily basis, moderate to severe psychological distress. 29% of them met the criteria for suicidal ideation and 3% attempted to kill themselves in the last year. Um, Over a third are diagnosed with anxiety um, and about 27% are diagnosed with depression and 12% had intentionally harmed themselves in the last year. So what does that tell you? I mean, if that's the young adults, you know, so sometimes these chronic illnesses are right out of the gate, like you just described, you know, you have the soft signs like colic or eczema or all these kinds of things that maybe life, um, life threatening food allergies or environmental allergies that you can kind of manage for a little while. But those soft signs will develop into a mental health disorder if left, you know, to the to the on their own without any kind of, um, you know, addressing the root causes. So that's why you're looking at the young adults now, who are seriously dealing with mental health issues. That's not a safe society. That's not a healthy society. That's not a society that can function, right? And so what what are all these kids getting right now? SSRIs, they're getting anti-anxiety, anti-depression medications, which are not good to be on long-term and can cause more like a cascade of other health issues. So it's a major problem. It is a major problem. You know, I used to work for a pharmaceutical company. In fact, I used to sell Zoloft. And so I was on the front lines of seeing how frequently and often these were just handed out. And, you know, I was talking with a therapist the other day, and she's been in this game a really long time. And she's like, you know, back in the day before you were able to prescribe an antidepressant, you, you know, you had to go through other health factors to rule out underlying conditions before you were able to prescribe an antidepressant. And I can assure you that is not happening. I think what a lot of parents should also take into consideration, and I, I want to I stay here a minute with you, Beth, because I know this is so big and I'm glad we're addressing it up front in, in case some parents can't continue through the entire podcast. But antidepressants have a black box warning on right. them for children under the age of 18. So I think this is where it gets controversial, right? 
maybe some parents are on some antidepressants, and then we immediately our flag go up, and it's that tension of, well, you know, are you're saying these are bad? I need them right in order to function. And like, look, we're we're not saying that these aren't a tool in the toolbox, but I think at the core of what's going on, and at least from what I've been through as a parent, what I have seen on the front lines working in pharmaceuticals, what I now have gone through as a parent, what I've also now gone through for my own training um, in health coaching. And here's the differential that I would ask a lot more parents to start leaning into. It's not necessarily that your children has a mental health condition. They are having mental health challenges associated with health conditions that are masking mental health problems. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it's, and, and so what causes that, right? Well, you could have metal toxicity, you could have chemical toxicity like glyphosate, or you could have different herbicides that are building up in your child's system. You could have mold, you could have underlying infections, you could have nutritional deficiencies, you could have gut dysbiosis, you could have Lyme, you could have all kinds of different things that are going on, which could be contributing to what Epidemic Answers in your organization talks a lot about, which is called toxic load. So I think that's so important for parents to understand because I talk to a lot and they're like, you know, we're going to see a therapist or we're going to see a psychiatrist or we're going to the doctor and they're giving in an antidepressant and they're not getting any better. And so here's why. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the, the thing is, is that our culture, which includes our, our medical system is not designed to look for root causes truly. And, and that's a generalization. Certainly there are tons of integrative and functional medicine doctors, naturopaths, osteopaths, chiropractors who do look at the root causes, but the larger medical system, like when you funnel into your primary care provider that covered that insurance covers, they're usually not giving you options and they're not telling you, all right, so your child has ADHD. Have you, um, let's, do, let's do a nutrient panel. Are they deficient in zinc? Are they deficient in magnesium? Are they deficient in omega fatty acids? Like, let's just take ADHD as, alone as an example. There's tons of literature um, that sh- says that these kids with ADHD have all kinds of nutrient deficiencies. Why can't we start there? That's mm-hmm. not the only contributing factor. It's a major piece of it. Blood glucose. There's kids with ADHD. We just um, released a story a month ago through our organization on our YouTube channel a child who had ADHD, who's basically his blood sugar was just constantly up and down, up and down, up and down, because his family didn't know about the importance of diet and how that impacted his ability to stay focused and attentive. And so they basically went on essentially a ketogenic diet, just took the, like the major refined sugars and carbohydrates out of his diet and ADHD is gone. That's not how it always is. But that's an example of like somebody looked at the root cause and be like, oh, this kid's blood sugar is out of control. Maybe we should address that. You know, another example is there's a whole series of functional dentists who believe ADHD is um, secondary to sleep disordered breathing or sleep apnea. These kids who who sleep um, with their mouth open, who don't have proper development of their jaw and their airways, and they're not getting oxygenation at night. They might be waking up 50 times a night because they can't get air. This is very common in this generation of children. Once you address that through, you can wear, you know, dental devices and things like that. But once you address, and these kids are getting oxygen at night, breathing through their nose, oxygenating their tissues, the ADHD symptoms go away. So it's usually never one thing, but those are examples of really low hanging fruit root causes that can Mm -hmm. be addressed for which there are practitioners. Oftentimes these, these things aren't covered by insurance, which is a systemic issue we have. This is a problem that, that we don't as a society support this kind of work yet. Yet we will at one point because there's plenty of evidence that this is, it's way better to like address a child's nutrient deficiencies and have them on medication for the rest of their life, right? Like that just makes so much sense. And there's a cost benefit to that too, right? Um, But we're just, we just haven't caught up for a variety of political and economic reasons. So there are answers under each one of these conditions. I don't care what your diagnosis is. There's reasons for it. Root causes is like you mentioned mental health as a function of things going on that like medical imbalances in the body, physiological imbalances of the body. We now have the tools through diagnostics and clinical assessments to be able to see where those, those imbalances are. A lot of them have to do with the gastrointestinal tract and the Absolutely. microbiome and all the things that, um, that that does for our, for our, for our mental health. So we have the tools. We just haven't, as a system, as a society, and our institutions, embraced these tools yet. Sadly. Yeah. I, I think with toxic load, would you just, even from epidemic answer standpoint, like, would you just, for 30 seconds to a minute, just really walk people through what is toxic load? 
So it, there's a there's a concept that there's a lot of different names for it, and it's been um, called allostatic load, which is what the medical community calls it. Total load, which was a term used by Patricia Lemmer, who's um, wrote has written some amazing books on autism. And essentially, the concept is that you know your human body only has so much capacity to tolerate stressors, health stressors, and there's all kinds of health stressors. There's toxins like mercury, cadmium, BPA, petroleum chemicals, fragrances, phthalates from your, you know, shampoos and laundry detergents and soaps and things like that. Those are all toxic to the body. Mm -hmm. Um, Emotional stress is toxic to the body. Um, All infections, like you mentioned, chronic infections cause you to use up all your nutrients and create inflammation in the body. So like your body only has so much capacity to manage all of those health stressors. Now, your body increases its capacity to manage those health stressors with certain health supporting practices, things that like before our generation, within the last 100 years, we've totally changed the way that we live. People used to do this as a function of being a human being on planet Earth, but that is sleeping, a full night's sleep, going to bed when the, you know, when the sun goes down or shortly thereafter, getting up when the sun rises, like having natural circadian rhythms, mm-hmm. drinking clean water without toxins in it, eating clean whole foods that not just nourish you, but feed your microbiome, which is important for immune health and for um, production of neurotransmitters and so much more. Um, you know, having good positive relationships, those, those, those build, that builds your capacity to tolerate stressors, um, nutrients, right? Nutrients, vitamin C's, antioxidants, essential fatty acids, all those good health supporting foods and nutrients expand your capacity to tolerate stressors. So what's happened in the modern world is we've decreased all those health supporting practices, mindfulness, prayer, those are all health supporting practices. We have increased the total load of stressors You can, and the stressors is the broadest category. It doesn't have to be just toxins or infections or things like that. It could be EMF. It could be fluorescent lights. Fluorescent lights are just stressful on the body to create oxidative stress and inflammation. So that ratio is out of balance, right? We should have more health supports than we do health stressors. Right now we have more stressors than we do supports. And what happens when you have that kind of ratio? You get symptoms, you get eczema, you get headaches, you get chronic constipation, you get all the things. So in my 15 years of following families who have reversed nearly every kind of chronic health condition, that's, you know, excluding sort of chromosomal things, that formula is applied. Everybody worked on decreasing the stressors, increasing the supports. And in the cases of kids who have neurodevelopmental conditions like autism or ADHD, oftentimes there's rehabilitative work that needs to happen. So that might mean, you know, when they were an infant, they had some kind of assault, Uh, three rounds of antibiotics impacted their ability here, then you'd have to have auditory Therapies, for instance, is one example. So that's, you know, that's the situation we're in right now. It's totally reversible, all of these conditions. Everybody can improve and transform their health, but you have to apply that formula. Decrease the stressors and increase the supports. Yeah. And and I know from reading your book, which again, Brain Under Attack, you know, I, I learned so much from this when I came across it a few years ago. And again, it's what changed the game for me. And we had been to a handful of providers you know, none of them were really piecing together. And we were we were somewhere in between, right, integrative medicine and Western medicine. And at the time, we weren't with the right provider. And I'm grateful for where they got us. But as parents are listening, I think it's so incredibly important to understand that, you know, working with a naturopathic provider or working with a functional medicine provider is going to be really important in this. Because to your point at the beginning of the podcast, right, our traditional healthcare system does not treat medicine this way. And so I'll give you an example. When we were starting out with my daughter, you know, we went through this and it just, the testing was so sporadic and so spread out. And so what's hard about this, and you brought it up, it's generally multiple things, right? So she had um, underlying Epstein-Barr. She had a 10 out of 10 severity with her gut dysbiosis, which was her microbiome having more bad guys in her system versus good guys, right? She was having some neuro inflammation. And so I think with families, you know, there's a lot of things that are going on there. And so it's hard to bring all of this together. And so that's why I think Epidemic Answers is such a great place to lean into. I know for me, it's why I'm creating a holistic wellness clinic that is more around care navigation for parents to walk into this and be able to have someone who understands how to look at this, bring it all together. Like you said, understand the functional dentistry, understand why vision is important, 
auditory, gut microbiome, but it was really difficult for us along the way because these tests were not being done in a timely fashion. Mm -hmm. They weren't well understood or they weren't well even executed from results that we were we were given. And so I can understand why this can be really overwhelming for parents. But what I love about you going over this is that it gives people an understanding as to what's going on and why it's happening. So there are mm-hmm. answers. So how would you, you know, I've I've talked with some, you know, friends. I've I've been on social media more sharing some of this. And here's something I hear. You can't reverse this and you can't fix it. And you're a bad person for making people feel like they can. And I want to mm-hmm. talk about this uh, because I think it's really important because it's it's kind of that divide between them and us. And I think we need to take it away because this core issue, again, is impacting our healthcare system, our educational system. In fact, it's crippling our educational system under right the special needs programs that are out there with IEPs and 504s. And so to me, it's not that we're saying anything is wrong with anyone. What we're saying is there is an opportunity to improve symptoms. And if that can increase quality of life for not just the individual, but for the entire family unit, because let's be real clear, this is a family affair. Mm -hmm. But how, how would you help individuals that maybe are on this podcast listening and being like, you know what? I'm not buying that. So first of all, I would say I would never judge anyone for not choosing this path. I chose the path of going towards integrative medicine, looking at root causes, and my results were life-changing for my family. Our whole family went and changed our diet, changed our environment. We live differently now. I actually firmly believe that our kids are here for a reason. They have shown up in this generation in 20, you know, 2020, let's say they started in the 1990s, showing up with all kinds of problems. And those of us who are shepherding them, guiding them as their parents, have the opportunity to see those symptoms and diagnoses as a wake-up call. Human beings cannot sustain their life the way that we're living in modern America. And it's true for the modern Western world, the modern industrial world. But the United States is probably the, the least healthy human beings on planet Earth right now. So here are these kids that are showing us, like, with this eczema and the behavioral problems and the gut problems and all these things, like, Hey, mom, dad, something is not right. You, I'm, I'm here and I'm unhealthy. Like, let's look at the root causes. They're literally here to teach us something. So if you want to take that as a wake up call and a, and a message, you're going to have, you're going to have health transformation. You're going to have the opportunity to know and learn and understand what it takes to keep human beings healthy. If you don't take that call, no judgment. It's fine. That's totally you. It, what is your priority? Do you, is your priority to live the way you're living right now? and you can manage the symptoms with medications, that's fine. No judgment. That is your path. That is your journey. But if you choose to hear the wake-up call and start digging and becoming a a detective to figure out what are the root causes here, why is this happening, if you're curious, you're going to have a different path. You're going to have the opportunity to transform your health. So I feel like, you know, we're also... we're also in a system that's not supporting the parents who want to choose the integrative holistic path. So it means it's hard. Like it is hard. No, I'm not sitting here being like, it's easy. Changing your diet alone is so challenging because if you think about it, what do we eat? We eat what our mamas fed us. That's cultural, right? We, we, um, food has so much wrapped up in it with, with emotions, et cetera, but it's absolutely foundational for human health. So I think it's, this is again, an opportunity for people to make a choice. Where, where do you want to go with this information? Your child is having symptoms. Are you in a place where you want them to be alleviated of their symptoms? You want to you know, find that path where you can get rid of that diagnosis? That's your choice. And there are people here to support you. The system isn't there to support you yet, but it's getting there. It's slowly beginning to get there. So that's the, that's the good news. So let's start with the standard American diet. SAD. Mm -hmm. appropriate acronym. Can Mm -hmm. you speak a bit more to that? So when we were at the conference, Dr. Brogan, who was one of the speakers, shared with the group that 90% of the US corn crops in America have one or more mold toxins Mm -hmm. in them because uh, the United States and the regulation that we hold, they they don't have to take a lot of these 
things out, but can you talk to the overall standard American diet and what's going on? And then underneath of it, how we're, how we're informing that ecosystem within our food with chemicals. Like they're kind of the same conversation, Mm -hmm. but people look at it. It's like, Oh, well I'm, I'm feeding my kids healthier food, but yet they're still getting poor outcomes. And again, they, they, they connect. And a lot of people I don't think understand why and how that is. Yeah. I, I, I like to think about whether it's food or, you know, the products in our home or whatever it is, I like to put it into the, the context of history. I was a history undergrad and I'm a history major in undergrad. And you kind of have to take the long view here. The way that people live now in modern America is like a fraction, teeny tiny, like barely even visible fraction in, uh, in terms of how humans have lived over the course of human history. And the food we eat is no exception to that. The food we eat now is so vastly different from the food that people have eaten for time immemorial, you know, um, there's a there's an incredible organization called the Weston A. Price Foundation, which was built out by um, built upon the teachings of a dentist um, in the 1920s who traveled around the world and looked at indigenous cultures who were still eating the way that their ancestors had been eating for thousands of years. And he found that they were so vibrantly healthy, had perfect bone and teeth structure, no cavities, no dental caries. Um, and he started documenting it and recording it. So he started asking, well, what are they eating? It's got to be the diet as compared to the, you know, the people that he as a dentist was treating in the United States and the UK and the Western countries who were eating um, foods that were like, you know, heavily processed and, and in sugar. And this is in the 1920s, even when we had industrialization of food really in the latter part of the 19th century, right? So like, post uh, Civil War, all of a sudden, we start having cereal, refined flours, packaged processed foods, right? So it's such a short window of time. You fast forward to today, we've taken that those very beginnings of industrial food, and all of our food is industrial, with you know a few exceptions. Except exceptions, and like unless you go to a farmer's market, um, you know, or you shop at some place like you know Whole Foods, which is becoming more industrial. Sometimes there's local foods there. Like you're eating a, a, an industrial food, and the problem with the industrial food is that the um in the processing all the nutrients are extracted you're you know things that are made with like wheat white flour there's no nutrition in them um they have been preserved in a way that makes them more toxic to your body so for instance the preservatives the chemicals the additives that are all go into the processing so if you're eating something in a package you're eating something that your body shouldn't and doesn't recognize to be food So, you know, the standard American diet has really evolved and it feels normal, right? Like we all live in this culture. We all live with like Starbucks and Chick-fil-A and all these things that, you know, we just drive up and get our food. The human body does not thrive on that kind of food production. So the the bodies that do the best are the way when, when they eat foods that have been prepared the way that our ancestors did. Whole foods um, prepared in, you know, in ways that are time tradition, um, honored. So like fermented vegetables, for instance, that's how people got vegetables in the winter time because you had to store it or, um, meats that are pastured and, um, that have been out grazing on, on grass or in nature rather than the CAFO industrial, you know, farms like the pork farms and the beef farms. All of those um, animals are pumped with uh, antibiotics. So if you're eating meat from a grocery store, you're probably getting antibiotics, you know, that are coming through. Or if you're eating meat at a, a fast food chain, you're getting antibiotics. Seed oils, that's another major, major problem with the standard American diet. It's not just the additives, the preservatives, but all the oils that are used in the processing are highly, highly inflammatory. So really the only oils um, that are you know, not inflammatory are the ones that have been around for thousands of years, beef tallow, um, lard, or um, coconut oil, olive oil, again, time honored foods, things that human beings have eaten for thousands of years. If you're eating canola oil, corn oil, safflower oil, sunflower oil, I could go on all these seed oils, they're new, they're new, right? So the, the, the long and short of it is modern food, modern industrial food is inflammatory. It's creating oxidative stress in our bodies. It's increasing our needs for antioxidants. So the the answer is to, in your diet, mimic as close as possible the foods that your great grandparents ate, like whatever your heritage is. Go back a hundred plus years, and what did what did people eat? I also I, I do like the Weston Price um, Foundation because they do give guidance on how to prepare foods 
the way that they have been soaking beans, for instance, soaking nuts. This is things that people did for thousands of years. Instead of eating it out of a bag, you soak it, you prepare it. There's a certain um, commitment you need to have to preparing your foods in a way that is digestible and so that we can assimilate our nutrients. That was probably a longer answer than your. No, it was out. it was beautiful, sis. Listen, I think too when you say inflammatory response, a lot of people probably don't know what that means. So we could even use my daughter as the example, right? She had a ten out of ten on her gut dysbiosis. You know, what a lot of people also don't know is that moms and dads, right? But moms are handing over seventy percent of their own toxic load over to their kids, right? And so mm-hmm. I was blown away that a lot of women diet. And before kids, and we're passing on these nutritional deficiencies, we're using all of these products that have all kinds of toxins in them. We are eating foods that have these antibiotics. Our kids are already, right, getting getting these in their systems and being born pre-polluted with an upwards of 200 toxins in their systems. Like, what? That's, that's insanity. But when we take, you know, like the seed oils, for instance, and you say that they're inflammatory, I would love for people to better understand what that means, right? So if you're having this gut permeability or you're having gut dysbiosis and you've got more bad guys than good guys, right? That that lining is just getting thinner and thinner. And so when we want to understand why kids are having may, maybe neuro symptoms or they're having mental illness, people need to understand, right? This is leaking out of your gut. <clears throat> these toxins, these food molecules, particles, they're going into your bloodstream and they're going to your brain, and they're crossing your blood-brain barrier, or they're crossing into other organs, and they're causing inflammation. They're causing issues. And so I don't know if you want to add more to that, but it it took me way too long in my journey um, before someone to explain that to me to better understand it and know why these toxins, why these preserv- preservatives, why these additives, why these food colorings, why these things are bad for our children. And then we wonder why they get behavioral or why they get aggressive or why they act the way they do. And then parents are just disciplining them. And I see and understand why, but they're not acting out. They're sick. Right. Right. I think inflammation is such a core underpinning of what we see as far as symptoms in our kids. You know, inflammation looks like a lot of things. It looks like rashes on your skin. It looks like um, an upset stomach. Uh, It looks like, you know, the brain inflammation, the behaviors oftentimes like if you look at depressions, par- depression, Parkinson's, ADHD, autism, I don't care what the mental health condition is, there's inflammation in the brain. So Absolutely. if you think about that for a second, if you think about, oh my gosh, there's inflammation in the brain, that should, that should really raise alarm bells for you. Like, why is there inflammation in the brain? And there's a, call, there's a bunch of reasons for that. But what inflammation is, is your, it's prote- inflammation isn't bad. Inflammation is good. Like every time there's like some, impl- I find out there's inflammation in my body. I'm like, oh, thank God my body knows that that's that something's wrong and it's trying to help. Mm-hmm. Inflammation is basically, you know, calling all your immune cells to task and saying there's something toxic here, there's something dangerous here, and it tries to do repair. That's what inflammation is, right? Like when you mm-hmm. sprain your ankle, it gets all, you know, inflamed because your body's trying to repair it in real time. So if there's inflammation that says there's something wrong, something toxic in my body's trying to fix it. So the idea is to remove the thing, the trigger that's causing the inflammation. And what you described is that basically the modern American gut is in a state of chronic inflammation or triggering chronic inflammation because we have grown the wrong balance of bacteria and microbes in our gut. So the microbiome is filled with trillions of bacteria, yeasts, viruses, parasites. Some of those are good or commensal or you know, probiotics, you you hear that term, there's things that you want in there, and it's supposed to be diverse. Americans have the least diverse guts of people on the planet right now. And the reason why is because of the way we're living. It's everybody, we're at the conference, and I asked um, during my session, how many people had had an antibiotic one or more rounds, and almost, I don't see one person that didn't raise their hand. We antibiotics wipe out your good gut bacteria, they wipe out your bad gut bacteria, They're, they're like a carpet bomb, they're like napalm in your gut. So the problem is, is that we've done that as a culture and our kids are now being born with less diversity. So if you think about it like a botanical garden and the more diversity of species you have, the better things are. And they all kind of regulate each other, right? Some of them even, you know, create these little metabolites that keep the other bacteria in check. So nature has a way of just keeping that balance. But if we keep putting things in like antibiotics, like glyphosate, like GMOs, like, you know, chemicals and toxins, that upsets the balance. 
proton pump inhibitors. So if the kid's ever been on reflux, asthma medications, if mom's ever been on birth control pills, those all affect our gut bacteria. So what happens then is you have, you wipe out the good guys and you, and you get an overgrowth of things like, you know, people talk about candida as an, one example of something that can overgrow. There's tons of types of bacteria that can overgrow. When those things overgrow, or they take up more space in the gastrointestinal tract than they're supposed to, they're releasing endotoxins, all these kinds of um, you know, cellular waste products that our body has to process. Another thing you mentioned was the leaking. So one of the things that can happen is hyperintestinal permeability, which is that the immune system has, is right under those epithelial cells in your gut, right? So when you have an, um, the wrong balance of bacteria in your gut, you start getting basically little holes that shouldn't be there, that should be better regulated by your epithelial cells. And you, all of a sudden the immune system's on attack, right? So the, the, you know, if you don't have a good balance of bacteria, your immune system is gonna be hyper revved up and it's going to be over reactive, under reactive. It's like why some people can't kick, kick out chronic infections because their immune mm -hmm. system can't, can't get there or why we're reactive to everything with allergies food allergies, like our immune system's overactive, autoimmune diseases, our immune system may be overactive in the, you know, in the wrong ways. And the other thing you mentioned, which I think is really important is when you see the mental health symptoms, whether it's something like autism, pans, pandas, depression, anxiety, the blood brain barrier often has been breached in the, your body. Again, the inflammation is going to the brain trying to, maybe there's an infection in the brain, maybe there's toxins in the brain. Your body is trying to, you know, eliminate that source of inflammation. But what happens is, it's going to your brain, where you're thinking, your behavior, cognition happens, your motor planning happens. So wherever the inflammation is in your brain, like if it's in your basal ganglia, that's going to, you know, the portion of your brain that's responsible for motor, a lot of motor issues, you're going to start seeing motor related symptoms. So if you, you know, like it's, it's a, a general rule to say, all right, I've got inflammation, or in my child's body, there's inflammation, I, I know there's mental health symptoms, what can I do to reduce inflammation and start learning all the things that can contribute to that. The gut, healing the gut is the absolute first and primary most important thing you can do. And then after that, it's like detoxing your environment. It's finding those latent infections, like you mentioned. Uh, it's finding emotional stress that can cause inflammation too. So um, it's really about doing what we can to nurture our bodies, heal our bodies, and bring that inflammatory load down. You know, you, you bring a uh, a, up a couple of what I think are distinctive points. And I keep hearing, and of course I would because you run Epidemic Answers, but there's hope in this, right? So mm -hmm. I that's what I want to bring out for families, you know, already maybe halfway through. This can feel overwhelming. It's a lot. You know some things are wrong. You know you want to fix them, but how? And so good news, you can. There are lots of things diet first and foremost, and that can feel really overwhelming. So I know we were on a house call with Epidemic Answers last month, and there was a group of us on there, and a mom is kind of going through exactly this, right? Mm -hmm. Realizing that she is having an experience with you know, some foods that are in their diet that maybe need to go. And so that's kind of how what we did on our call together as a group is we're like, hey, listen, don't you're not going to conquer Rome in a day, sis, right? So mm -hmm. Take this, take this for a week at a time and then take that week and do it for the whole month. Like you don't have to be a gourmet cook. You don't have to, you know, take the same thing for breakfast and, and go with that. Take the same thing for lunch, go with that. Take the same thing for dinner, go with that. You know, if you need help, there's definitely health coaches and nutritionists and functional medicine and naturopathic doctors that are out there who can help you. But if it feels overwhelming, it's okay, right? I mean, our brain, I read a statistic not that long ago. It's like your brain can handle about a 10% change at a time. Mm -hmm. Well, mm -hmm. look at what we're doing to ourselves just day to day as Americans or moms or parents. And like, you're already at the threshold before adding any of this stuff on, right? Mm -hmm. So you have to, you know, you gotta, you gotta just take some deep breaths like we did at the beginning of this call realize maybe there are some things that could potentially be going on, you know, get with the right provider, get with the right individual, understand, you know, with diet, what are some things that need to change, but there is hope. And that's with, you know, even our own daughter, you know, we started out not knowing a lot and it took us, you know, two and a half years is where we even got informed 
And then it took two and a half years to really get her what I would call comfortable and get us settled. What's really mm -hmm. beautiful, and I'll give even more hope to our listeners, is you know, my son over the summer started developing pan symptoms. And listen, not my first rodeo. And with opening, you know, my my own holistic wellness clinic, we were able to get him comfortable, situated, and turned around in three weeks. Mm -hmm. Now, mm -hmm. is that mm -hmm. gonna be everyone? No, but that's the difference of understanding, right? Starting to educate yourself on something like this and starting out in the right path versus trying to do this all on your own, which I do not recommend because right. it's there's so tons hard. Of help out there. There's tons of help out there. And there, here's the greatest hack for somebody who's just coming to this for the first time. There's one thing you need to do and one thing only. That is put your mindset on the idea that healing is possible for your child. This was part one of my interview with Beth Lambert from Epidemic Answers. Join us next week for part two. Thanks for tuning in, sis. Remember, you are enough as is. See you next time. Until then, join me on Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, or TikTok at Mama Trauma Barbie. And please subscribe, leave a review, and share the podcast with your other mama friends. Thanks again to our sponsors, Precision Chiropractic, Jennifer Pansition with Edward Jones, Dutch Maids, the Avalon Foundation, and Chica Creative for helping us land the mothership in the real world.